this presentation, we will take a look at multiple choice questions related to receivables. First question. The person who signs a note receivable is A. Maker B. Payee C. Holder D. Receiver E. Owner We'll read through this again and see if we can cross off some options with the process of elimination. The person who signs a note receivable is. Now, note, if we look at a note receivable, you might first start thinking, well, uh, maybe both parties, there should be two people signing the note receivable. But typically, it's only required oftentimes for one individual to sign the note receivable. And for the reasoning of that, we need to know that the notes receivable is basically kind of like a promise. So a note receivable is, is an individual promising to pay uh, in the future at some point. So we can imagine if we have a, a debt that is due, and we say, well, I'm not gonna pay you now, but I'll write this little note here and give a formal note telling you that I will pay you in the future. That's what's going on here. So uh, who's gonna be the person who signs it, the one who's making it? So if we look at this, A is the maker. And so that sounds good, right? The maker, it seems like a technical term. You might not uh, hear or think of the maker of the note, uh, but that's gonna be a technical term. Typically that looks like a good term to use. That's what it's probably gonna be. B is gonna be the payee. Now the difference between the payee and the payor is a little bit confusing. We just have to know the terminology payee and, and then the payor. The payor is gonna be the one that eventually pays the payment at the end of the note term. And then the payee is gonna be the one that's gonna be receiving it. So the payee may sign the note, but not really required to sign the note. The one who's making the promise to pay uh, is gonna be the, the, the one that needs to sign. That's gonna be the payor. Uh, the holder of the note. The holder of the note is probably going to be uh, the one that uh, is going to get paid at the end. The payee is the one that's going to hold the note. And again, they're not the one that really needs to sign it. The one that needs to sign it is the one making the promise that is get then giving the note to the holder uh, that will then be able to use it for collection at the future. Uh, the receiver, I, I'm not sure that's exactly a technical term there, the receiver of the note. Uh, I think, uh, but that sounds more, even if it were, more of a, the holder of the note. And again, the holder of the note is not the individual that is, is signing the note per se, uh, or is required to sign it, the one that uh, is making it is. And then the owner, uh, it's not really an owner of a note, right? So the note doesn't, you know, you could say that the holder has possession of the note, but I don't think that term really applies here. So it looks like the maker is what we are left with. So the person who signs a note receivable is the maker of the note receivable. Next question. A credit sale results in A, a debit to accounts receivable account in the general ledger and in the customer accounts, in the customer's account in the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger. B, credit to the accounts receivable account in the general ledger and to the customer's account in the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger. C, a debit in the accounts receivable account in the general ledger and a credit to the customer's account in the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger. D, a credit to the accounts receivable account in the general ledger and a debit to the customer's account in the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger. And E, a credit to the sales and a credit to the customer's account in the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger. Okay, so one more time, we'll see if we can go through this with the process of elimination. Uh, a credit sale results in. Now this one, since it actually has a journal entry, we might first wanna just record the journal entry. I would, I would say write it down. It doesn't have a dollar amount, you may say. That's okay, we can still write down what the debit and credit would be. And that would typically a credit sale, we made a sale and we didn't get cash, we got AR, accounts receivable. So I can just put a dollar sign or something for the dollar amount or just put an amount of 100 or something like that to show us that uh, that represents some type of amount. We don't know. They didn't give us that. That's okay. And then the credit's going to go to something like income or revenue or sales, whatever the income account is. So that's the normal journal entry. Now, they're talking about this subsidiary ledger type thing. And remember, that, that really is going to be supporting, backing up, the accounts receivable account. So you got the accounts receivable account and then some type of subsidiary ledger which will give us the same information by order of customer. 
So A then says um, a debit to the accounts receivable. That looks good. Account in the general ledger. This journal entry is going to be posted to the GL, the general ledger. And a customer uh, accounts in the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger. So that would be also a debit to the subsidiary ledger. And that sounds pretty good because that's really what's happening here. We're debiting both the general ledger and the subsidiary ledger. Let's look through the rest of them though. Uh, B says a credit to, to the accounts uh, receivable account in the general ledger, a credit, and we're debiting the general ledger for accounts receivable. So that's why that one's not right. C says a debit to the accounts receivable in the general ledger. So a debit to the accounts receivable, that looks good, and a credit to the customer's account in the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger. Now we wouldn't be crediting the subsidiary ledger. We're basically doing the same thing too at this journal entry. We are, in essence, posting the same AR debit both to the GL general ledger and to the subsidiary ledger. The subsidiary ledger being the same thing as the general ledger, except that it's ordered in a different order rather than being just in order by date, it being ordered first by a customer. So then D says a credit to the accounts receivable account, and that's not correct. We're not crediting, we're debiting the accounts receivable. And E says a credit to sales and a credit to the customer account in the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger. We will credit income or sales, whatever that account is, sales, uh, but we're gonna debit accounts receivable, which in essence is the subsidiary ledger and the GL ledger. So we're not gonna credit the um, accounts receivable accounts. That's why that is incorrect. So A looks like our correct answer. Once again, a credit sale results in A, a debit to the accounts receivable account in the general ledger and a customer account customer's account in the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger next question a promissory note is a investment for the maker b a written promise to pay a specified amount of money at a certain date c an asset to the maker d an installment receivable e can never be used in payment of an accounts receivable. So we'll go through the process of elimination. Question one more time. A promissory note is A, an investment to the maker. Uh, you, you may have a question on who the maker is. So I'll, I'll leave that one for now. I mean, you could think of a, a note as a kind of investment. B says a written promise to pay a specific amount of money at a certain date. And it, that promissory note, that sounds pretty good. That sounds like a pretty good definition. And then C says an asset to the maker. So once again, we've got this maker term here. So let's, let's leave that one for now. D says an installment receivable. And not necessarily an installment type sale unless it says it was an installment. So I'm going to cross that. E says it can never be used in payment of accounts receivable. And it's possible actually to do that. We could say, okay, we can't pay you the accounts receivable. How about we sign a note receivable? And they might accept that because the note receivable would then charge interest. So that might be, we could actually, you know, use a note receivable as payment for an accounts receivable. So we're left with A, B, and C. So a promissory note is, A says an investment to the maker, and C says an asset to the maker. Now note that those two kind of cancel each other out in some ways. They can't both be correct. And even if we didn't know what the maker is, if something was both an investment and an asset, they would both be, you know, if it was an investment, it would have to be an asset typically. So that's one reason just looking at the multiple choice format, we could say, hmm, those two don't look right. And we can kind of cross those out. Now, who is the maker? That's the one that is actually signing the note. So the maker is actually the one that um, is making the promise of the note. So that's usually the customer, in other words. Now, it, that's a little deceiving of a term because oftentimes the, the person who you know writes the, the note will be the, the business because th that's what they do. They make a standard note. But you can think of the note as a promise being made by the maker, the one, the customer, who's promising to pay in the future and therefore, they're the one that's going to sign it as if they made it, as if they wrote up the note and said, I'm going to promise you to pay whatever I owe you in the note and sign it and give it to the other individual, that being the business. So the maker, then, uh, it's not an investment to them, it's kind of like a liability to them. 
and so that's not correct here and that's why it's not an asset to the maker it could be an asset to the uh, receiver or the holder of the note so b looks like our correct answer a written promise to pay a specific amount of money at a certain date so once again a promissory note is b a written promise to pay a specific amount of money at a certain date